I think what you have to realize as an adult, especially a parent, especially with someone who has special needs, is that you had your opportunity to travel before kids and you'll have to, the opportunity after they're grown. This is really their time and you have to build the trip around them because if they have a good time, you're going to have a good time. And so it's really about creating a child centric vacation. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Mom Talks with Krista. I hope you're having a great week so far. We have got another great episode for you today that I cannot wait to share. With summer vacation right around the corner, parents are always looking for tips of how they can travel better, how they can prepare for the trip. And I know it brings on a lot of anxiety. And especially for parents of children with special needs, it brings on a whole new level of stress, planning, and, you know, preparation. So today I have Dawn Barclay here discussing her new book, Traveling Different, Vacation Strategies for Parents of the Anxious, the Inflexible, and the Neurodiverse. We cover so many topics and her book is amazing. It covers how to plan for trips, traveling, domestic and internationally, what places have the best resources. She shares lots of great tips that I honestly think any parent can benefit from. Um, just the amount of work and resource that she puts into this book. It's your one-stop shop, your travel Bible for traveling with kids with special needs and beyond. Um, so I highly recommend you check it out, but she's going to talk all about that and more. And of course, stick around at the very end of the episode for our mom tales of the week. This is where we read your responses to our questions we post on social media. And we always have a lot of fun with those. All right. Without further ado, here's my interview with Don Barclay. Enjoy. Hi, Don. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. I am so excited to talk to you. I know we've got a lot to talk about, but first get started. Can you just tell us a little bit about who you are? My name is Dawn M. Barkley. I have spent uh, over 30 years in a career as a uh, journalist in the travel industry on and off. And I've worked in various uh, aspects of travel as well. Uh, I grew up as the daughter of uh, a major, two major owners of a travel agency, or I should say <laughs> two owners of a major travel agency in Manhattan. And then I worked my way into short-term apartment rentals throughout the world. I was uh, head of sales and marketing. I've worked for various travel magazines and I uh, have two children who I will say were anxious and inflexible, which is why the book is written the way it is. Uh, and they did not travel well as children. And uh, when I needed a book, like the one I've written, it was not available. So I ended up writing it. Awesome. Yeah. I think, I mean, that speaks to so many people that I talk to on, on the show in general is that when you go through something yourself and you look for a resource and it's not there, then you're like, okay, I think there's going to be some other moms out there. that are going to look for this and need this. Yes. And there were no resources for people on the spectrum in, uh, for travel or with mood or attention disorders. And so I broadened the scope of the book. So it is called traveling different vacation strategies for parents of the anxious, the inflexible and the neurodiverse. Awesome. And so talking about your book a little bit, to break it down kind of first, what does it mean to be parents of anxious and flexible and neurodiverse for those that are aware, aren't aware of all the terms? Well, they know anxious and inflexible. Your kid just doesn't like transitions, is, is frightened to venture out and try new things. With neurodiverse, it covers children on the autism spectrum, as well as children with attention disorders, such as ADHD or mood disorders, such as bipolar. I've included information on borderline personality disorder and Tourette's, but it is just a general scope because a lot of these disorders have comorbid symptoms and what works for one child works for another. And what was interesting for me when I wrote it is that many of the special needs travel tips would help neurotypical children as well. Yeah, I'm sure there's there's always parents looking for some kind of helpful tip because traveling with children alone can be stressful, can be hard in the family. And so I think so many families are going to find a benefit to, to your book. I hope so. I, I think that the keys to traveling with children are universal and they include starting small and making things predictable 
and uh, creating a frame of reference for the child through advanced preparation. And I go into all of that in depth along with various hotels and airline programs and museums and cruise lines. And you have it that have special programs specifically for this audience. So kind of like you mentioned, you cover so many different topics in your book and so many, share so many tips. But so for those listening today, what's, what are some of your key tips that parents should stick to when it goes to vacationing with their kids? It, what the really important is to understand that any child when taken out of their comfort zone is going to be anxious or inflexible. They don't have to be on the spectrum to have those kind of issues. What seems like a lot of fun for you and me might be very frightening for a child. So it's very important to put yourself in their shoes and look at it from their perspective. So I always recommend starting small. And what does that mean? It means that before you take, you know, a two week trip around the country with different hotel rooms every night, Mm -hmm. you might go to a friend's house or um, an understanding relative's house and just sleep overnight one night. So you can see how the child's going to react in a bedroom other than his or hers. And so you'll have a better knowledge of what to bring and how to prepare when you do go on that expensive vacation. Uh, It might be buying picture books that talk about their favorite characters and how they uh, experience traveling so that they can relate. It might be showing videos. And thank goodness we live in this age of technology when there are videos for everything. You can show videos of the hotel or of the airport or of any aspect. I know one father who shows videos of the different uh, rides at the amusement park they're going to go to so that they can rule out what's not going to work. It involves scheduling and figuring out that you're not gonna do everything in one day. Maybe you're gonna do one or two things each day because traveling with children is not like traveling before you had children. You really have to pace yourself. Uh, There was just so much about even going to local aquariums or zoos or even a, a garage sale and framing it as an adventure or a tour because then you've created a frame of reference. The child enjoys this. And then when you're planning the bigger trip, you can say, oh, remember when we went on the tour of, you know, the local zoo? Well, this is going to be a little bit like that. So you're creating some flexibility for them and some, some, I'm sorry, predictability for them. Yeah. I love that because then it's not like throwing in, throwing them into a scary situation. It's more testing the waters going little by little to kind of encourage them build confidence. Yeah. You also get a buy-in from them. Maybe you have them help you plan the trip. And when you give them different options, you make sure that all of them are okay with you. So there's no wrong answer or you have them help pack or help pick out what they're going to bring, get a buy-in. So they're more positive about the vacation. Also think about what their special interests and hobbies are. And this is especially true for children on the spectrum who might have special interests that they are, you know, thrilled about 24, you know, 16 hours a day. It's all they talk about. I have a section of the book. It's one of my favorite, favorite chapters. And it's about building a trip around a child's special interests. So if your child has a thing about trolley cars or elevators or whatever is that unusual interest, you can find a museum that caters to it. And I've broken it down by by state and then by city. So you can say, okay, we're good. This is only in the town, you know, next to us. We can go over there and we can, you know, really get you involved in something you love. And that would be a wonderful bonding experience for the child as well. Oh yeah, that's amazing. So having better like planning tips, you know, kind of where you can go and, get them excited about seeing different things as well. Yes. And so when you have a child on the spectrum or with special needs, there are travel counselors who have been specifically trained on how to work with you and help you. And they're called certified autism travel professionals. I've interviewed tons of them in the book and I have a, a, I list how to find them even ones that did not that are not quoted in the book. You can find all of the people who've been trained. There are also um, places that are either autism, call themselves autism friendly or have been certified as certified autism centers. And they are specifically trained to work with this population and give you what you need. 
something else you talk about is when you go on vacation and your child has a meltdown or, you know, breaks down about something, how do you as parents feel more confident to kind of block out, you know, maybe judging people walking by or comments? How can you kind of move through those um, in a better, more productive way? Yeah, I have a whole section about how various parents deal with this. Uh, and the one thing they all said was that the person they worry about is the child. They block out everybody else because they don't matter. What matters is your child and getting your child to a quiet place to decompress, maybe getting them some food, you know, sitting down with them and finding out what the trigger is. But a lot of people don't travel. I mean, it was a survey of special needs parents and 93% of them said they would travel if they knew what, where to go and what to do, but they weren't traveling now. And a lot of their reasons were because they were scared what people would think. They, they thought, oh, they're going to think that I'm a bad parent, that my child is misbehaving and they don't understand what a sensory overload is or what a sensory meltdown is. And so a lot of what the book is, is preparing you so you don't go through that. But a lot of times it's removing the child from the crowd or the sounds, um, maybe going into a dark place if they are affected by fluorescent lights or bringing with you your noise canceling headphones and, and sunglasses. You'll know your child, so you'll know what they need. Yeah, absolutely. Because every, you know, every child is so different. So like, you're going to know like what they might respond to better, what kind of areas they might respond to. Yes. Awesome. And so you hear this a lot, you know, with parents in general about feeling, you know, guilty for enjoying themselves on vacation. So how can, I mean, I'm sure your, your book has so many tips on how they can make it an enjoyable vacation for everybody. So how can the parents make sure they enjoy themselves on this vacation and not feel guilty, you know, at different parts? I think what you have to realize as an adult, especially a parent, especially with someone who has special needs is that you had your opportunity to travel before kids and you'll have to, the opportunity after they're grown. This is really their time and you have to build the trip around them because if they have a good time, you're going to have a good time. And so it's really about creating a child-centric vacation. But what I have done is list tons of places that are either autism friendly or certified autism centers so that you'd be able to go and know that the people are trained to help your child and you're going to have less incidents, more people who are understanding, who've been trained with sensitivity. Uh, there are places such as beaches, which are in Turks and Caicos, and also two locations in uh, Jamaica, which are advanced certified autism centers. And they have kids clubs where the people are trained to work with the children. So if you want to put your child, if your child is the type of child that would work well in a in a kid's club, they can spend the day with people who understand them and you and your significant other can enjoy the day as well. And that's also true for five different uh, major cruise lines who have been trained in how to deal with this population. And there is a company called Autism on the Seas, which also arranges for um, families to travel together, or they can even work individually and create the amenities that you need. But if you want to travel with others that are going through something similar and you want to go as a group, that is a good option as well. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's awesome that there are different resources out there that people can be aware of in different areas to know that there's people supporting them, people that know how to help and get involved. Yes. Awesome. And so this one kind of just came to me, but so, you know, we talk about, you know, children that are a little more inflexible and, you know, if you can like escape a certain area, bring them to a calmer area. So what about, you know, areas like an airport or a train station where you can't be quite as inflexible? You have, you know, you have to stick to a schedule or you have to be in a certain area. So what kind of recommendations do you have for that? A lot of it is the preparation in advance. Now I do talk the, the airlines, the airline chapter is very long and it gives a lot of tips about how to work with different children. And it might be that a lot of what's upsetting are the crowds. So what you might, and standing in line. So if two people are going with a child 
or children. One of them might check in while the other one is in a quieter place. You keep your stroller with you if your child's in a stroller so the child is less likely to run away or elope, as they say. You may be waiting until the last minute to get on board if your child does not want to be in a tight, confined place, or if your child wants to get on board because they're itchy to go on, you'll go on early, but you'll speak. A lot of it's about communication. You'll speak to the people at the the front desk at a hotel. You'll speak to the people um, at the gate, the gate agent to tell them what you need in advance. And they're always you're usually eager to help you because nobody wants a meltdown. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people get on the plane and explain to the people on either side of them a little bit about what the child might be going through. They certainly speak to the flight attendant and explain to them what might be happening and and what the child's sensory issues are. Some people give out little gift bags to the people on either side of them. And there's an explanation of what the, the disability is along with say some chocolate and some headphones so that you can use earplugs or a mask, an eye mask or something to help them block out. And it shows that you understand what they may be going through. And you're sort of asking for them to understand what you're going through as well. Again, what you want to bring electronics. So your child is always occupied uh, with their favorite movies or games, and you want to bring their favorite foods as much as you can on the plane or the trains. And you may have little um, surprise gifts that you hand out during the course of the trip. So they're always, you know, occupied with something. Yeah. Those are great tips. Cause yeah, you just kind of think with like traveling and stuff, like, I mean, even I, I get stressed, you know, stress and kind of anxious going, going to travel. And so like, I can only imagine for a child or a child with special needs, how, how that can be. So those are great sure. tips for preparation. Yeah. And there's so many more there. I'm just skimming the surface. Yeah, absolutely. And so what is, what is a common mistake or maybe like when parents reflect that you see a lot of parents kind of say like, Ooh, next time I'm going to not do this. Something that parents can kind of like learn from. The scheduling, making sure that you don't try to cram everything into one day. I have a lot of parents who say, yeah, I have all these pictures of my trip and it's us carrying the kid on our back because they fell asleep halfway through, or they fell asleep, you know, on the table at lunch. So they, you really have to pace yourself. Some people decide that the first day they're on a camping trip or in a new place is a decompression day. Again, picking activities that will keep the child's interest. Even if that's not the only thing you do, there should be something specifically designed for the child. Picking places that have autism friendly or certified autism center designations so people know how to work with you. And, and realizing that, again, you have to build it around the child and you have to prepare in advance. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Preparation is definitely key because I think then you're kind of, you know, if something happens that you're not planning for, you know, what plan B will be or what you can kind of do yeah. to kind of veer away from that. Yeah. It's really a matter of thinking the trip out from the moment you leave the house to the moment you come back. And even how are you going to handle, say, the uh, the bus that might take you from the airport to the hotel, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there are tips for every single part of the trip, including restaurant dining and how you're going to handle that, whether you want to stay in a vacation rental, which would be just your family. So there's a little more quiet and privacy, or if you're going to work with a hotel, how to evaluate vacation rentals to see if they will work for you. Same thing with campsites. There's a checklist of how to evaluate a campsite in advance. So uh, all the way through to coming back home. I think it's important that you're bringing light to all these different resources and options people have for asking questions. Because I think a lot of times like we're, we're scared to ask questions or scared to say like, hey, I need this. And, you know, asking a front desk how they can help you or asking a flight attendant how they can help you when a lot of times they're more than willing or more than capable of helping. Yeah. And you have to be your child's advocate. So if you don't get help from that frontline worker, you should be uh, advised to go and speak to a supervisor. Don't be afraid. You're an advocate for your child. Yeah, absolutely. And so I know we've been talking about your book this whole time, but to kind of expand on it. So what else can people learn about in the books? What other kind of topics do you cover in it? So for anyone listening that's interested, 
Um, what, what all can they kind of expect from the book? Uh, well, I've broken it up into different modes of transportation, as well as whether you want to go domestically or internationally. And like I said, camping, I have information on uh, sports vacations that are specially therapeutic because they're individual sports like golfing, scuba diving, and adaptive skiing with uh, places to go for that. I talk about uh, how to rent a houseboat if you don't want to get involved in a cruise. Uh, how to, uh, why you might want to choose a dude ranch uh, or how to get uh, into the national parks at a discount if you have a child on the spectrum. A lot of personal anecdotes from parents, a lot of um, quotes from the travel professionals on how they handle things. I've spoken to Tony Atwood, who's an expert in autism, Dr. Ellen Lippman, who's an expert in ADHD, especially with girls. So there's just, it's, it's not my story. I mean, it's a culmination of hundreds of interviews. Uh, and uh, I would hope that it would help people be able to plan a vacation, even to a place, like there are tourist boards that are getting involved in getting autism certified and they are getting all the individual components in their location trained. So hotels, restaurants, venues like Mesa, Arizona, or Azalea, California, uh, Surfside City and uh, Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. So I discuss all of that as well. Awesome. I think that's great that you have so many other parent stories and, you know, real take on things because I mean, we always talk about here is like the community and support with you know, people that are in the same situation or similar situations is so powerful because then you can really connect on those levels. Thank you. Yeah. And I invite people who read the book to send me comments about their anecdotes, which I'll put on the blog that backs up the uh, black backs up the book because things are always changing. And I always emphasize anything you read in the book, do your due diligence and call before you go. Make sure that what the venue considers autism friendly is is truly what you need, what their designation means, and that none of the information has changed because things change by the day. Uh, And also someplace that might have, say, a a sensory afternoon at a, uh, a museum where there's low lighting and fewer crowds, that might be offered one day a month, and that might not be the day that you're in town. So it's really important to do due diligence and check as well. I give all the, the phone numbers and the uh, URLs for any place I mention. Awesome. So it's like a, what you call it, like your, your travel Bible almost Yes. You have everything in there, everything you'll need, but also taking that responsibility on yourself and being like, okay, here's the number I'm going to call and make sure this is still accurate or still will work for my family. Absolutely. And what I started to say, and I, I got sidetracked is um, my email is there as well. So if they do want to send me comments and tell me something that's different than what I said. It it said, well, this was not my experience. My experience was this. Uh, I will share that with the readership on the blog and I I post to Twitter and I post to Facebook and the website is travelingdifferent.com and it will back up and update the book as changes, uh, you know, as I find out about changes. But also if if listeners just have had their world opened up a little because Uh, they read the book. I'd like to know that too, because that would make me feel really good. Yeah. Awesome. I'm sure it's always good to hear back, hear from people like what they thought and yeah, all their feedback. Awesome. So of course, where can everyone get this book? When will it be available and all that good stuff? It's available for pre-order now. It's launching on August 15th, but right now you can pre-order the hardcover and the audio book. You won't be able to pre-order the ebook until August 15th. Uh, It's available on my publisher's website, which is Roman and Littlefield, but also Amazon, Barnes and Noble. If you Google the name Traveling Different and my name, Dawn Ann Barkley, all the places will come up. And I have a bunch of them listed at travelingdifferent.com as well. Awesome. And I know you've written like a lot of different books. Do you, have you written other like travel books before or like for parents or what kind of is your like realm of books? Uh, Well, I have written travel columns in the past, mostly for uh, the travel trade. The books I write are fiction. They are most definitely not for children. (laughs) I write psychological thrillers and I write uh, romantic suspense. Uh, Some of them are a little racy. I write under the the name D period, M period bar, B-A-R-R. 
And that's okay. another website, dmbar.com. Uh, and I do love writing fiction. Uh, I really thought this book was going to be my first book and it ended up being my eighth book. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you had plans for this book for a long time and then like other yeah. books kind of came Well, out. it wasn't that. I wanted to write it back in 2008 and I started doing the interviews for it then. That's when I spoke to Tony Atwood. I interviewed oh. Ellen Littman. And then I hit a wall because the, it was very hard to find travel professionals who I could speak to. And it wasn't until this particular CATP designation was created by uh, IB. CCES that I knew how I wanted to write the book because I had all these people I could interview and they could introduce me to their the families involved and there was so much more on the internet that I could pull from so uh, that's why this book came last when when I was laid off because of COVID I had plenty of time to finally write it right <laughs> I've been hearing that so much is like when things kind of shut down, people were almost like forced to like focus on something they've like either put off or like yeah. a passion project or whatever. So yeah. four yeah. books during COVID. And I used to think that was a lot until I met somebody at a book fair the other day who said they wrote 28 books during lockdown. And I was like, well, I feel bad now. Oh. Oh, <laughs> I wow. feel like a slacker. <laughs> it's like an impossible standard. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. This woman is so prolific. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I only wrote four. <laughs> only four. Oh only four. <laughs> well, I can say that's more than me. So there you go. <laughs> no, that's that's really awesome. I think this is uh, this is a cool book, and I'm sure like hearing you know people's responses to it will probably inspire more books because you're gonna get more stories from people. And yeah, I hope to write an international version because this one uh, mainly speaks about locations in the United States, although the tips would work for anyone anywhere, but I, I had to limit what I was going to cover. So most of the venues are in the States. I'd also like to write a book uh, about adults with uh, special needs traveling and what they've managed to accomplish. So we'll see how this book goes and then I'll, I'll speak to the publisher. Yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. So I always like to end these interviews with fun thinking question. And I always ask if you could have a billboard made today where you could share one tip with moms everywhere, what would you have it say? When I was pregnant with my daughter, I read that every mom is entitled to 2000 mistakes. And I always found that very comforting. I mean, I'm sure I exceeded that. But I think it's it's something to remember because we're all going, there's no manual and we're all going through the same thing. And it just, it's not predictable. No matter how many books about parenting are written, you, you can't anticipate what's going to happen. Yeah, I love that because I think people can be so hard on themselves and like, you know, like a mistake is the end of the world. But if we don't make mistakes, how are we going to learn? How are we going to keep moving along? You know? Yeah. I think that's great. And of course, I know you just said your website, but again, for everyone listening, where can people follow you, find your books and so much? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, travelingdifferent.com and that's traveling with one L.com will show you all the, the nonfiction. It will take you to where you can um, get a link to this podcast as well as uh, any of the places to buy the book, as well as the blog backing up the book. And www.dmbar.com is my fiction. And go to your favorite retailer to purchase the book. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was so nice talking with you. We've never covered this kind of topic before. And I think a lot of parents are going to find it very beneficial. I hope so. Thanks so much for having me. All right, guys, it's time for our mom tales of the week. And Boy, we have like some great answers today. We asked, what's the funniest lie your child has ever told you? And I just say these are some of my favorite responses we have, we have ever had. I didn't pick as many as normal because some of them are longer stories, but believe me, it's gonna be worth it. Okay, here we go. Number one, Mackenzie. We took my four-year-old son to Legoland in California. We were waiting in line for a mechanical pony ride that he was very excited for and could do by himself. The attendant was asking every child their age before they got on the ride. We hadn't thought to talk to him about why. When he got to the front of the line, the attendant asked him his age. He hesitated and looked at us. We reassured him. Then as cool and as confident as he could, he said, um, 18. Everyone within the earshot was rolling. Apparently he was worried he wasn't old enough. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. I remember that like fear of like going up to a, to a line for a ride and like not being old enough. Well, for me, it was mostly a fear I wasn't tall enough because I was always the shortest in my class, you know, the youngest in my family. So we'd go somewhere. I was like trying to like stand up really tall. I was always afraid I would not be tall enough to ride. So I get that kid's anxiety. Okay. Number two, Christy. My daughter was three and farted loudly and then said, that was a woodpecker. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just love how like quick witted that was. Just, it was a woodpecker. There's nothing I can do about it. Okay. Number three, Sarah. I'm a preschool teacher. One of our three-year-olds who is very smart told me today is my last day as a kid. I start college on Saturday and let out a huge sigh. I just start college on Saturday. No big deal. Oh my God. I love that. Okay. Number four, Hannah. I wrote on a wall when I was very little. My dad asked me if I did it. I responded, no, Todd did it. There is no Todd. He says, oh, walks out of the room, comes back five minutes later and tells me, I just got off the phone with Todd's mom. Todd said, you did it. Checkmate. I love that. I love that the dad like played along with it and was just like, mm, I called Todd's mom. Sorry. He threw you under the bus. I love that. That's, that's very creative. All right. Number five, Jen. Son walks into the bedroom about 5 a.m. Son, my pants are wet. Me, did you pee the bed? Son, no. Me, then how are they wet? Son, water. Me, what water? Son, from my body. Me, so you peed your bed. Son, no. Me, then what water? Son, the water from my wee wee. Me, so you peed your bed. Son, no, I peed my pants. Me, where were you? Son, in bed, asleep. And that folks is parenting. Okay, I think that's hilarious because he didn't want to admit that he peed the bed, but he would admit to peeing his pants. He was just very specific about what he did. I love that. Okay, number six, Shelby. My four-year-old had been jumping in mud puddles near our house, which he was specifically told not to do. When he came up to me covered in splashes of fresh mud, I asked him what happened, and he looked at me right in the eye and said, I have no idea. So if you just forget, I mean, it doesn't really count, right? You didn't break the rules. Number seven, Kimberly. I just remembered this one that my sister told me. In her preschool, a nurse came in to test everyone's hearing. The nurse tried to make it fun by saying, let's play a game. When you hear the beep, raise your hand. My sister failed the test miserably. My mom got the results and was totally distraught because her sister, our aunt, was born deaf. She struggled a lot through our childhood in school, making friends. The following weeks until my sister could get an appointment with a really great hearing specialist were very upsetting according to my mom. She read every book she could and asked my aunt hundreds of questions. The morning of my sister's appointment with the hearing specialist, my sister and my dad, who was quite the jokester, so my sister assumed he'd love this, were talking about hearing tests and what to expect that day. Then she said very proudly, Daddy, the hearing nurse said, let's play a game. So I played my own game. My sister took the silly little game aspects a little way too seriously. Clearly confused, he asked her to elaborate. Apparently her game was to do the opposite of what she was told. My dad explained how that's a big problem and now we don't know if there's really any hearing problems. She cried because she thought she was in trouble and did something wrong. The poor kid was so nervous during the next hearing test, she raised her hand, indicating she could hear the beep before the machine was on. Luckily, they had an alternative test where she, the specialist whispered across the room about ice cream, and she certainly heard that. Needless to say, she has perfect hearing. Oh my gosh. How far can you go on with a joke before telling someone? I love that she didn't even think there was anything wrong with it. She was just like, this is funny. The nurse said, let's play a game, so I was playing one too. Oh gosh. Okay. I was always so nervous at those things. I'd be like, yes, like raise my hand. Number eight, Jerry. My kid swiped a cool looking pencil from another student's desk. The teacher saw it happen and confronted my kid. My kid adamantly denied it. When the teacher pointed to this pencil sitting on my kid's desk, 
my kid suddenly pretended to be blind and said she didn't realize she'd taken a pencil because she couldn't see. She was seven. Wow, that is really funny now, but I bet you were just like, what is going on? To, put, to pretend you can't see a pencil you just took, like, oh. just like the forgetting thing. Like, well, if I forgot, then it obviously didn't happen, so. Oh man, these kids, that's funny. All right, guys, well, I loved reading the favorite lies that your, your kids told you so far. We had tons in the group and on Instagram. This was a lot of fun to read. Thank you everyone that submitted your responses. I had so much fun reading these. Of course, check it out next week for our new Mom Tales of the Week, and I will see you next week for a, another awesome interview. Thanks, guys. Hey guys, if you found this or any episode of Mom Talks with Krista helpful, please like, comment, subscribe, and of course, share it with your friends. We release new videos every single Wednesday, and our new podcast is out every single Thursday. So lots of different ways you can catch us. And of course, if you're not following us on our socials, go ahead and follow us there. We've got tons of new content for you every single day. And finally, if you're watching this and doubting yourself, you're doing a great job. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.